welcome everyone. My name is Christine Harding. I am the Director of Marketing and Communication for the National Cryptologic Museum Foundation, who are bringing you today's cybersecurity chat. Our guest speaker today is Tony Rudkowski. He was a lawyer and an engineer who was also an executive director of the Internet Society um, during some key years of the Internet's uh, development in the 1990s. Um, he has a lot to share. Um, that really is just one, one really basic summary of all of his experience, and he's going to share that with us today. So, Tony? By the way, one footnote on uh, the, uh, the uh, history, uh, personal history, is I had the uh, honor of working for the DARPA director who approved the development of TCPIP and the uh, original ARPA internet, uh, Steve Lukasik. Uh, and um, so that was my first introduction back in the 70s. So it's been uh, quite a trip. Uh, along those lines, uh, what I try to do is uh, structure this in a way that's interesting, and maybe we could pause for uh, questions after each uh, slide. There's only uh, uh, six slides. I try to make this kind of in, in the nugget size. But to um, portray this sort of not a one-off thing, but that this is really part of a long arc of, uh, of history. And that came about um, actually when I first came to work for the government for the FCC in the 70s, I kept on asking where things had come from, where ideas, concepts, technologies, and uh, always like to trace back. And it was absolutely fascinating that uh, it, almost everything had a precursor that this stuff uh, basically is built upon and built upon and built upon, whether it's technology or law or institutions or even the problems, and that um, uh, hence these things don't really uh, change. So with that ado, let me uh, start with uh, what are really kind of two basics uh, if we're gonna talk about this subject. Uh, one is what is cybersecurity? And the other is uh, what is internet? And there are, mindful there are many spellings of that so uh, cybersecurity here, um, and this is kind of a holistic uh, concept of cybersecurity. It's about authenticating, protecting, and analyzing information at rest, uh, stored somewhere, that is, or moving, uh, often described uh, as on the pipe, or generating uh, more information, which is that when uh, this exists somewhere or is moving through a transport system, that itself generates more information about what's happening. And that's part of the analysis process, particularly for cybersecurity. And the other is to one is, what is the internet? Uh, again, um, at the sort of uh, meta level, it's about moving information messages uh, from a source to one or more destinations. Uh, often it's one to one, but in many cases, e.g. broadcasting, uh, such as what we're doing now is really one to many destinations. And it's, it includes this concept of through different interconnected communications media. So that's kind of a key part of this as well. And I'll be talking about that in the subsequent slides. Uh, but I note uh, kind of as a footnote in recent years, the term internet has become almost meaningless. In fact, there was a famous um, legal IPR agreement in the year 2000 that it is, it, it is by definition without meaning. It can be anything. So uh, where do we be begin this arc? So I actually go back to the uh, point at which people decided to communicate literally goes that far. And if you have the, um, the uh, ability to visit the, um, the National uh, Cryptological Museum, you can see that the exhibits are actually designed uh, along those lines. Um, they take you back to, to, you know, basically times in which Roman soldiers uh, carried encrypted messages uh, that were um, tattooed or otherwise written on their scalps. So they were the packets of the, the original personal internet. So um, there were humans, and then it sort of evolved to uh, physical objects, e.g. letters, the postal system. Uh, then you had uh, visual, what's known as visual telegraph. It was originally known, or semaphore, and then electronic objects or electrical telegraph. And uh, in, in, in along that uh, evolutionary uh, path, 
Uh, encryption was used fairly early on uh, for two purposes uh, that remain the case today. One is to authenticate in some way uh, the message itself, the information, and the other is to protect it. Um, so you can keep that in mind as we sort of go for, uh, uh, forward. So the first digital network internet with encryption actually emerged uh, in the uh, 1840s. It was known as the electrical telegraph. And uh, the first international agreement to put um, national networks together uh, occurred in Dresden in 1850. Uh, that's significant from an international law standpoint. The most significant ca uh, change, however, which is really quite uh, revolutionary, was radio, which emerged in the uh, 1890s. The first um, practical uses uh, began to appear around 1896. And uh, the kind of uh, what I consider funky uh, footnote, which was recently undercovered, uh, uncovered uh, by some um, um, uh, material that uh, one of the NSA historians published, uh, was that Grover Cleveland ran a radio-based internet out of the White House in late 1898 to communicate with and collect intelligence from U.S. embassies abroad. And there's a really interesting picture in this, uh, in this publication uh, of the, the control room in the White House that basically did this. So uh, the radio internet significantly scaled development and use of encryption technologies because uh, the, the reality that this was information that was basically going through an open medium, um, in some cases, essentially worldwide. And anyone with a receiver could receive it and um, they could see, they could read those messages. So um, encryption technologies emerged uh, essentially at the outset. Uh, it, they became increasingly sophisticated over the coming years. So, um, and then the other kind of inter interesting um, uh, set of factoids that has come out uh, in recent years is that interception and decryption of messages by France won World War I and uh, ended up fostering the origin of the National Security Agency. All the, uh, the kind of precursor players of what became the National Security Agency for the United States ended up um, part of the allied effort in France and they met in a northern um, uh, French town called Chaumont, and they basically exchanged techniques there. And then they, uh, th th those, that established relationships that, uh, for example, that uh, Friedman uh, continued uh, for years onward. And um, again, in some of the material that's now appearing in the, uh, in the NSA historian publications and at the museum, basically uh, uh, talk about those years. Uh, and then, of course, history repeated itself in the UK during World War II, and that's where uh, Turing and the Colossus computer uh, pointed uh, to the future. Um, actually, I should have pulled it out, but I actually have one of the vacuum tubes from Colossus. Um, I um, had visited um, Bletchley Park where that was done several times and happened to be there when they were rebuilding the Colossus computer, and they had a bunch of extra vacuum tubes uh, which I, probably most kids today won't, wouldn't even know what they were, but they were the equivalent of little um, uh, valves, as they were called uh, in the UK, that um, were part of the computational uh, capability. The next r kind of major development uh, was uh, the uh, geostationary satellites. So uh, these are satellites that are put far enough out in orbit that they remain stationary. And in the 1960s, those began to be put up as mechanisms for uh, relatively fast uh, international communication. So um, uh, there are a bunch of things began to happen in, in that time period. Uh, so one of them was uh, in the U.S. at RAND, Paul Barron, and then in the UK, Davies' idea of using computers to create and route digital packaged uh, changed the way communications transport technology in the 1960s was uh, occurred. Uh, and uh, Larry Roberts, uh, who worked at DARPA, uh, built the first Ar uh, ARPANET uh, to implement that technology. 
that was pretty revolutionary. But uh, again, uh, and this is where it gets confusing, that was not per se the internet, although it was ARPANET. The other interesting uh, factoid here is that because this new technology allowed these packet networks uh, to access uh, computational and information resources remotely, um, NSA realized in uh, 1969 that uh, uh, there was a potential here for some significant problems in terms of new vul vulnerabilities and began hosting the first uh, conference, at least publicly at that point. Uh, the other kind of interesting uh, factoid here too as well is that you had these networks with all these, these, these computers, uh, otherwise known as network hosts connected to them. And uh, uh, a young woman by the name of Peggy Carp and Miter said, um, in a kind of a very practical uh, sense, uh, as opposed to males uh, that dominated the environment, these things should have names so that they're more uh, easily uh, recognized and accessible. So you don't have to t type a, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a cryptic uh, endpoint address to reach a particular machine. You could simply say, I want to go to, to MIT Multics. And it, 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 so then your connection was established. So that was pretty revolutionary. And as time goes forward, uh, it's part of what we know now as DNS addresses. So that, that system of basically identifying endpoints continued to evolve. Um, the other really big change um, is uh, Louis Poisson in 1971 came up with this concept of datagrams in the creation of connectionless networks. It's often said the internet was invented in the U.S. Well, actually it was not. <laughs> it was invented in France by Louis Poisson in 1971. And what happened is all the people sort of who worked on this stuff at the time uh, met at these international meetings and exchanged information. And then it ended up ticking off a whole bunch of things happening in the 70s and 80s. One of them was Bob Metcalf, who was at MIT, uh, described uh, local area networks, this concept for a local area network in, in an Ethernet protocol in 1973. And he based it on, uh, this goes back to uh, uh, Hawaii, the AlohaNet protocol, which was used, it was developed by researchers in Hawaii, basically for satellite uh, packet network communications to to Hawaii, and even today, um, these devices like your phone, they have several Ethernet addresses, and those Ethernet addresses, sort of at the lowest levels, are what are used to establish the um, internet uh, protocol-based communications that are right on top. Uh, the other thing that happened, uh, and this is where my former boss uh, Steve Lukasik turned on Bob Kahn at DARPA to basically um, have uh, DARPA begin to get a handle on this stuff. And uh, uh, he published in 1974 uh, the first um, uh, uh, internet protocol that was described as a host-to-host -host protocol. So again, it was a kind of an evolution of, of Louis Poisson's idea in, in more concrete form. The other thing that happened too is uh, as you go along that decade is Bell Labs uh, released a, a Unix to Unix uh, internet protocol in 1979. And also um, uh, Fuchs at uh, uh, Princeton uh, developed for IBM a, an internet called BitNet. So as you sort of move into the, um, the beginning of the 80s, there are sort of all these different internets that are all coexisting and, um, and interconnected or gatewayed to, together in, in, in kind of strange ways. Really interesting, though, those, uh, some of the uh, BICES network. I don't know if you remember the BICES stuff. So I think those early networks, it'll be interesting to see how they glumped them all together here. Oh, indeed. Uh, it, I mean, I've left uh, several of them out, off. Uh, there were some uh, really clever ones. Uh, that were uh, done uh, on basically just dial-up telephone networks um, that were used uh, for developing countries, particularly where they basically um, uh, hung the uh, hung the host together over internets that were dialed up on demand. The other kind of interesting factoid is that there was a bank consortium who developed an internet for all the ATM machines of the world. And one of the things they did is trademarked the, the word internet. 
And that became a big deal as the time went on, because as people started using the word internet, they've said, you can't use it because we've tra- it's, a reg- it's our registered trademark. And uh, that, that uh, controversy was not resolved until uh, the year 2000, as I mentioned, with this agreement at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office that internet meant nothing and anyone could claim it for any purpose. <laughs> Um, so um, the other uh, kind of a significant um, development that helped drive a lot of this is Bell Labs developed their own uh, internet protocol. It was known as Signaling System 7 in the 1980s, uh, and it, it began to be used for, for signaling purposes, that is, constructing telephone services, but also for messaging popularly known as short message service or SMS. And to this day, when you use this phone to send text messages, it is using that that internet protocol. It is still in use today, and it ended up uh, being the biggest moneymaker in the world for uh, internet services, believe it or not. The other thing that happened is the um, national communication system, which doesn't exist anymore, was an uh, agency in the U.S. consisting of a whole bunch of other government agencies that was formed by President Kennedy to uh, basically uh, develop uh, infrastructures and and rules of the road for uh, emergencies, as well as DOD uh, developed a set of additional uh, protocols that are variously known as the OSI protocols, and the specific one is CLMP, which is the Connectionless uh, Network Protocol. And uh, so that emerged in the 1980s. Um, And then lastly, but perhaps not least, um, um, largely in Europe uh, and largely driven by the United Kingdom, GSM developed uh, mobile internet protocols uh, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, And again, it was kind of like a a, um, a videotape uh, evolution where uh, GSM uh, became the dominant global network uh, protocol. And so almost all the phones, except a few that you still get from uh, U.S. carriers and, and Korean carriers, which are CDMA, uh, use a GSM. Uh, and that's important because this is all moving forward, as I'll mention at the end, uh, towards something called 5G or fixed 5G. The other thing to remember uh, is that um, that uh, was a, a game changer here is very large scale uh, integration, uh, shrunk computers at the same time as fiber technology increased communications bandwidth. And um, I was sort of at the FCC at the time and I was responsible for um, evaluating uh, these technologies and, um, um, and determining uh, what uh, the... Uh, FCC policy ought to be towards them. And uh, this sort of changed every year as to how things were evolving. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Larry Roberts, who developed the first ARPANET, actually gave lectures uh, at MITRE in suburban Virginia every year uh, in which he would describe something called Roberts' Law, in which he described, he, he actually had these projections of where large-scale integration was going and what the computational capabilities were going to be going forward a few years, as well as the optical fiber uh, technology and the interplays between them. And uh, those were absolutely absolutely fascinating lectures, but sort of um, uh, basically uh, were were significant in terms of uh, determining um, where uh, where we were heading. the other thing that's not well known, uh, in which there's actually a little task force that's uh, being uh, put together uh, under uh, uh, Tony Sager, or courtesy of Tony Sager, and uh, Roger Callahan, who was the um, head of NSA's uh, information assurance uh, effort in the 1980s, uh, initiated something called the, the Secure Data Network System, or SDNS, and there were a, a, a suite of uh, secure internet protocols. So all of this stuff was supposed to be moving forward in the late 80s and um, that, that it would actually provide a secure internet infrastructure. Uh, it didn't happen, uh, at least quite like everyone thought. Uh, the other big, uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint, um, data point was, um, was Robert Morse, Worm, 
which caused the first uh, massive internet uh, disruption for three days in November 1988. So this is the this is the uh, the DARPA internet that interconnected all the uh, at the time all the educational institutions and some of the government agencies. It was taken down actually for for three days because of this worm that uh, a grad student, uh, Robert Tappan Morris, unleashed on the network. And um, that got uh, significant attention. And uh, what was ironic is that happened a few weeks before this international internet treaty was agreed in Melbourne in 1988. I had the sort of honor of not only being part of that, of, of writing part of that treaty, along with my boss at the time from Australia. And uh, as a result, uh, during the treaty, the Russian KGB uh, representatives actually came to us and said, these cybersecurity provisions have to be in that treaty or they will not sign it. And uh, so they were at it. These things, it, it sort of never got implemented like everyone thought, uh, but it, in terms of um, a, a historical development and capturing sort of the dynamics of, of what's important, uh, it, it's important. So we uh, sort of move forward here. So you sort of get in the 1990s and uh, the thing that really started to drive internet use are known as graphical user interfaces. So this is, uh, these were popularized as uh, web browsers uh, and they drove uh, public and business use. Uh, that was really kind of intriguing because um, at the time this thing called the World Wide Web wasn't considered particularly useful because it was, uh, it was developed uh, at CERN, which is a, a atomic research facility outside of Geneva. Again, as fate happens, <laughs> I happened to be there at the time in my career. And, um, uh, but then uh, it, the development uh, by, Mar Mar by Mark Andreessen, who is a, a basically a disconnect, uh, a, a, it's kind of a disgruntled student who could write really good code at the University of Illinois was tasked with developing a, a, uh, a object-based interface and uh, uh, make, he, they made the software available online for the servers and for people, uh, for applications that people could download, including for uh, Microsoft platforms. And that just, just basically sort of revolution, revolutionized everything. Then we, 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 you know, we, we, we sort of have the, all these different internets, uh, but then in the 1990s, uh, basically there's this kind of grand uh, convergence on, uh, for the for one set of internets converged uh, on the uh, CON TCP IP protocol, and the other was uh, on the GSM protocol that sort of won the war internationally for, for mobile uses. The other thing that began to happen is, uh, and this was an attribute of uh, TCP IP networks in particular, they were designed for academic use, not for public infrastructure. And so they were, they were really open and really vulnerable. And although they produced this convergence and uh, fueled uh, uh, internet of things uh, starting to be a, uh, attached to them, um, there are articles in the 1990s about how, you know, how to connect your, your coffee machine. And there were even, um, IOT at the time was referred to as, as, as silicon cockroaches. And the, the, um, the, the cybersecurity concern was that what happens if all the cockroaches basically start talking at the same time? And uh, everyone realized there was an emerging problem. So um, everything network connected starts becoming vulnerable to attack. Uh, and then uh, sort of that resulted in, uh, because of the increasing use of that infrastructure for crime, uh, a, the Cybercrime Convention, which is another inter international treaty, was signed in 2001 at uh, Budapest. And that, that, that convention is still growing and still evolving. Uh, the other thing that happened, of course, is mobile phones and computers uh, converged uh, in the 2000s, uh, largely, you know, thanks to Apple. And uh, sort of everyone adopted and evolved that technology. And as a result, most of us sort of live with these, these combination devices that uh, probably we spend too much time on. 
Um, the other thing that really happened, uh, NSA and uh, now the, what's the Center for Internet Security, which is responsible for some of the uh, NSA uh, developed cyber defense protocols uh, at the time, started to bring those into existence. Uh, and those remain today the primary cyber defense tools. And I provided a link at the end on how to basically get to um, the page for those. Another development was that open networks created uh, what are known as global persistent cyber threats in the 2010s. Uh, things just started to get worse. Uh, and then lastly, as massive back bandwidth and internet connectivity plus computational integration resulted in cloud data center architectures in the late 2000s and 10s. And as uh, my fate has it, I actually live in Ashburn, Virginia, which is the cloud data center capital of the world. <laughs> and uh, almost uh, all, of our, all of our woods and forests around the area have all been chopped down and there's just data centers everywhere. So uh, that's definitely a big deal around here. And the reason that happened is in large measure because the uh, TCP IP internet ended up being hubbed internationally through this area. And also the A root server of the domain name system was uh, located here. And uh, so that made it that, that plus there are some government agencies that were high um, bandwidth users. So uh, as a result, um, there's enormous, what's known as low latency uh, bandwidth available in this area, which is, reason, which is why all these data centers are here. So again, uh, before I get to the last slide, any comment? Actually, there is, um, Tony. Um, uh, asks, did the person who created uh, the Morris worm get into trouble? Uh, yes. <laughs> Robert Tappan Morris. <laughs> actually, I'm not sure whether he actually spent time, but he was, uh, he, he did get a cut felony conviction for what he did. But uh, the rather interesting footnote, which came out in the New York Times um, articles, uh, there was a young um, New York Times business reporter uh, by the name of John Markoff. And John was really a good sleuth. Um, and so uh, he kept on basically trying to discover more information about Robert Tapp and Morris. Uh, as it turns out, he had interviewed his father. <laughs> Didn't take, take much to put two and two together uh, a few weeks earlier. So the elder Robert Morris was NSA's chief scientist. So needless to say, <laughs> that raised a few eyebrows, a whole bunch of different places. And I, I, there, was, there was no connection whatsoever, other than uh, the fact that um, he was uh, who his father was. Uh, but um, uh, needless to say, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly in, in internet cybersecurity history, it's, it's a fascinating factoid. And then, so here we are at the end. What is our life going to look like going forward? Um, I, I certainly have, um, in my uh, sort of 50 plus years in this business, uh, have come to eschew crystal balls. Uh, things don't end up always um, evolving the way one thinks. But nonetheless, one can uh, at least project forward a little bit. So the stage is uh, certainly set for what I call rapid, dynamic, internet, extraterritorial virtualization and resources on demand worldwide. And that's a whole bunch of words and it's represented in press and literature. And you can go search on this stuff by 5G, F5G, which is fixed 5G. People don't realize that the same technology is run on landlines on S5G, which is satellite 5Gs. And those are going in like gangbusters because uh, Microsoft just announced that they're going to be offering 5G services through Elon Musk's Starlink service worldwide. And there's a standards group devoted to S5G as well as extraterritorial implementations, which means instantial, instantiating these things virtually uh, uh, across borders. Uh, NFV is, stands for Network Functions Virtualization. So that is a whole bunch of technology and protocols 
that basically help create these virtualized networks and architectures, as well as uh, MEC, which is a kind of another interesting variant. So this is a multifunctional edge computing. So if you can conceive of somewhere in one of those uh, access points near where you are having a, your own little data center that has a lot of computational capabilities uh, available that you can access on demand uh, are, is part of this uh, evolution. But um, this, is, this is, I would say, probably the single biggest uh, development that's, that's underway today and in which most of the industry work is occurring uh, uh, most of the politics is occurring, and there are a lot, not a lot of good solutions in some cases. Tony, um, can you talk uh, about some uh, media outlets talk that uh, China is really driving the 5G and that the uh, United States has pretty much kind of abdicated its, its uh, application to just buying the, the Chinese uh, application, uh, and obviously, which creates um, some concern. Can can you talk a little bit about that? Is is that really true, or are is the United States developing its own five G uh, um, uh, technologies and, and infrastructure? Well, this is where perhaps I'm a bit outspoken, and you can sort of you can do a search in my name and read all my stuff. And I also uh, for a couple of people, including. CIS actually do every couple of weeks an analysis of what's going on. Uh, so I can, if so you want to contact me at my e- email address, I'll be happy to sort of uh, provide you with additional links. First of all, 5G is not all that important, if I may say so. 5G simply is a term used for the radio links that are used. And frankly, that's not particularly consequential. The important thing is the virtualization of all the, all the um, network devices, including your own phone, uh, and, and virtualization of the services. That's what's really important. And uh, no, China didn't, didn't develop that. Uh, there's a, a group called 3GPP. It's a, a massive consortium of companies and and countries and agencies, it rotates around the world, meeting one month uh, in the United States, one month uh, in Europe, uh, the next month in uh, Asia Pacific region, and they just sort of rotate. So that all began emerging about five years ago. Um, And uh, the US players uh, have demonstrably, uh, by any measure, uh, played a very significant role in all of that. Um, what is happening is, unfortunately, a lot of this has been s- sort of caught up in what I call contemporary politics and, and a focus on the radio boxes, basically, that, that provide the, the service, of which China has a couple of vendors, notably Maui, uh, Huawei, that have been very active in that marketplace, uh, but there are a whole bunch of others in Europe. Uh, there aren't so many in the United States because with the disappearance of Bell Labs and Western Electric, you know, 30 years ago, the United States uh, vendors largely got out of the box business with the exception of, uh, you know, Juniper, Cisco, and people who make router boxes. But the uh, endpoint uh, radio boxes, by and large, um, have basically been ceded to off offshore vendors. So I, I won't say that th- there is, there is uh, no chance of or no, no concern for uh, China or for that matter, any other country uh, basically exploiting vulnerabilities in these systems. Uh, but there's a, a massive effort devoted to that. And um, that's where the focus needs to be rather than uh, the, just the nonsensical politics. Does that help? Sure does. And that was one of the reasons I wanted uh, to ask is, is because I think there's uh, uh, not a lot of clarity um, in, in that realm. So thank you for providing that. I appreciate it. Sure. By the way, uh, if you know Michael Warner uh, over at Cyber Command, uh, Michael's actually reviewing a really excellent uh, paper on, uh, on, that, on that topic, which I think can be made public. So I think that'll be helpful as well. 
the other uh, dynamic here, and no pun intended, is the communication sources, architectures, and endpoints are, are increasingly dynamic. We haul around our, our, you know, our smartphones all over the place all the time. Um, devices are moving, our cars are moving. That's only gonna get more dynamic. Uh, the other thing that's happening is these uh, communication architectures with these new technologies uh, can be created on demand. So you can create a, 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 literally a global network, a global internet uh, that has kind of all kinds of massive resources for five minutes and tear it down. And these can be, these are architected out of cloud data centers. So where the U.S. really uh, starts um, coming to the fore here, and that was certainly recognized by the Microsoft announcement, uh, and they're not alone, AWS and Google and everybody else is doing the same thing, realizing that these cloud data centers are the real gold mines in this whole 5G, fixed 5G, satellite 5G world. And to the extent that they can architect these these networks and these uh, services on demand throughout the world and provide content is where the real money is and where the real strategic value is. The other thing that's unfortunately happening uh, is fast, ubiquitous, cheap encryption is hiding everything and diminishing trust. And there's a whole bunch of detail there. Um, as it turns out, I uh, actually chair a uh, international group on this that uh, was supposed to meet this morning uh, internationally, but didn't, which is focus on this. Um, and uh, if anyone is sort of interested in this, it, uh, I'm happy to provide you pointers. Uh, in fact, I think I may have uh, included some in the next section. Uh, artificial intelligence and alternative realities create both opportunities and threats. The alternative realities are actually are playing out in our political systems and the exploits being used by our adversaries. And um, I'm not sure you know, there's good uh, answers in that realm because um, it's a problem of, you know, what can you trust? What can't you trust? And that's getting uh, pretty dicey to uh, differentiate between. And you've then got a, a clash too between basically sort of what does the First Amendment mean in this context when, uh, you know, is somebody have a First Amendment right to create an alternative reality that has devastating consequences? Not an easy answer to that one. The exploits are also increasing. The uh, critical security controls, uh, which uh, uh, Tony Sager and uh, um, Kurt Dukes and a lot of people who are the leaders at uh, NSA on the IA side are maintaining, those are uh, evolving uh, constantly and being applied to these environments that are sort of up above, um, like the cloud data centers. There's an implementation for that. So the... Um, the cyber attacks are also creating uh, sort of redundant here, economic, political, and societal threats and quandaries. Uh, cyber defense uh, needs to be, uh, needs are producing holistic internet uh, virtualization. Uh, the answer there, uh, what this means is, uh, believe it or not, uh, DOD a few weeks ago, uh, as well as Cloudflare, announced an in the in basically the internet as in terms of everything that's out there virtualized for you in their cloud data center with the idea being that you subscribe to that service. And if malware get, basically gets downloaded to you, it's there and sandboxed detected. And then it basically helps protect you. Uh, so that's the idea behind this DOD RFP that is, that is basically just gone out there. Um, as well as, as it turns out, one of the major cloud vendors who's already put up a similar service. And then lastly, um, uh, this is a little bit further on the horizon, but uh, what's known as quantum computing remains a potentially a major disruption. So if uh, quantum computers can create all kinds of new services, especially on demand as part of these mech services, and be used for uh, defeating uh, encryption capabilities or, um, or, uh, or uh, encrypted key trust capabilities, that's a big problem. And uh, so there's a bunch of work going on on what's known as post-quantum uh, cryptography. And that's a major area of development as well. So those are, those are the, you know, uh, certainly uh, for students, if you want to get uh, a job assurance, 
probably for the rest of your life, you focus on one or more of these, um, it, 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 it's probably a pretty done deal. So uh, uh, that's Tony, we got some really interesting questions. We have one uh, that says, I live in the fourth largest metropolitan area of the U.S. with 6.3 million other people, and yet I can't purchase an internet connection faster than 50 megabits per second. Uh, do you see fiber optic connection to the internet uh, for most parts of the country in our lifetime? Well, um, actually, as an ex-FCC guy who faced this in quandary, uh, the answer is uh, that's always going to be a problem. Uh, it costs lots of money to haul fiber uh, to remote areas. Um, the the, politic, the um, regulatory parlance is underserved areas, um, and um, um, you can't really get around those economics. Uh, but what you do have alternatives like uh, some of the new 5G technologies or satellite 5G do cobble together uh, more spectrum so you get more bandwidth. So you may well get something that's you know approaching a gigabit per second uh, via a, uh, a, a radio-based connection. Uh, I'm not sure what, I, I think actually Starlink is advertising some, somewhere up in the like hundreds of uh, megabits per second. It's a bit asymmetric, uh, but that's another option as well. And then uh, increasingly you actually got, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, long distance ethernet uh, technologies uh, coming into existence. Uh, so uh, all of those uh, are, um, are going to produce more bandwidth. But the other really important thing, which I sort of haven't underscored here, is you want low latency bandwidth as well. So this is, you not only want, you, you not, not only want more in terms of bits per second through, through whatever, you know, pipe or RF link you have, what you do, what you want is really uh, a, a very short length of time between when you make a request and when you get that, when you when you get a response, which is basically known as latency, and those are getting down into the millisecond range, and uh, that's another uh, one of the changes here is the internet protocol protocols look like they're beginning to sort of go back to Ethernet. In fact, there's a there's a standard uh, that's out uh, uh, for uh, basically cobbling together uh, Ethernet. Ethernet-based pipes from uh, some uh, remote point to you that has extremely high bandwidth and very low latency. Uh, and that's a revolutionary development as well. There's another question about if you look at the Israeli Checkpoint website, you can view real-time cyber wars going on 24-7 between most countries worldwide. W what do you see as the future of cyber wars? In the old days, these cyber attacks would have been considered an act of war. Well, that's probably a better question for uh, Michael Warner, and I'm not sure whether he's in this series. But um, uh, yeah. since he was uh, uh, CIA's former historian, he's especially knowledgeable. Um, and uh, so maybe uh, we'll uh, – I, I would sort of uh, demur on that. Uh, I um, – I, I'm a bit disappointed because um, I was in Melbourne in 19, 1988 and negotiated this, this uh, treaty uh, with my boss and a bunch of other people uh, that would have put an end to that. That was December 1988. It never happened uh, for a whole bunch of reasons because um, – which, um, I, again, you can look at one of my links. I sort of talk about that, why it didn't happen. But uh, the political resolve amongst countries basically precludes it. Uh, the question is whether it's going when is it going to get bad enough? Or when some of the mechanisms that are uh, described on this page um, sort of uh, at the end um, help mitigate uh, the ability to engage in cyber war. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, it, the, it's, it's a kind of a combination of, of political will, agreements internationally, uh, and technologies and operations that are going to shape the answer to that question. 
Cool. Um, there's another one of, of with all that you know, uh, do you feel your data is secure and do you do anything personally out of uh, to provide extra precautions for your home systems and, and what you do? Uh, good question. <laughs> In fact, uh, I maintain basically all the family's machines. So one of the things I do is uh, I use machines that have a TPM chip on them and I encrypt my drives uh, using a TPM uh, and its implementation, the OS that I'm using. I uh, update um, the machine's as soon as those updates are available. <laughs> so um, if you're not familiar with Patch Tuesday, particularly for Microsoft uh, devices, that's uh, Tuesday, every Tuesday at 12 noon Pacific time is when Microsoft releases the patches or the system updates. Uh, the reason why that's important is that within a half hour, and I've been on FBI uh, committees in which I've, got, I've seen presentations of this, uh, the exploiters have downloaded those patches, reverse engineered them, and developed exploits that are on the black market. That's a half hour afterwards. So you basically, if you want to be really <laughs> sort of anal compulsive about this or careful, uh, you want to be querying your machine a few minutes after 12 noon uh, on Tuesdays, Pacific time, and, and download those patches or new systems and get them on board. Um, so mine are all the very latest, as well as uh, every, uh, at least twice a day, I download the threat profiles that are checking. And then, uh, so that's just my machine. I uh, use Ethernet internally, so I don't have a lot of RF floating around. Uh, and then I've got several firewalls that have to be, be gone through. And, um, but it's a, it's a problem. I mean, even uh, geez, this morning, um, I got an SMS message. If you're an MMS message, if you don't want to download MMS messages on your smartphones, it, kill them, get rid of them. They are, a, they are the prime exploit ve vectors mm. for malware on the phones. So it, it's not only your, your computers, it, it's you know, the, these handy kinds of devices as well. And, and uh, being savvy enough to know what to do and what not to do. Uh, and again, the CIS people and Jane Lude, who used to uh, run um, cybersecurity over at DHS, has been an uh, adv ardent advocate of the term cyber hygiene. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's really caught on worldwide. Uh, so what you want to do is be uh, uh, really cognizant of cyber hygiene. Excellent. Excellent. And we have a final question here for IoT devices. Do you think it is safe to use them today, given that the firmware is not auto-updated on a regular basis? Uh, again, a uh, major problem that everyone is facing. And here again, it requires, I mean, I, I'm sort of comfortable, uh, although I admittedly all my IoT devices I do through uh, Wi-Fi through a separate link in the house mm -hmm. that goes separately through my router. Uh, so it basically, that's why I kind of partition the Wi-Fi stuff uh, that might be more potentially vulnerable because of IoT devices versus uh, machines that I have connected and, and servers uh, on the Ethernet. Um, and, but um, it's sort of as we speak, one of the entities in which I participate, which is the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, actually uh, has been leading the world in coming up with an IoT uh, cybersecurity a set of standards in which, uh, amongst other things, uh, in order to get certified for use, they have to specify the mechanisms for firmware update and how often that's going to occur and make that known to, to, to users and, and, and they enforce it. Um, in fact, um, there's even an implementation specification uh, for it in which they do testing, which um, 
which is uh, run by this, uh, which was actually developed by this marvelous, somewhat uh, senior uh, German uh, woman cybersecurity expert with this thick German, lovely thick German accent, uh, Gisela. And so Gisela actually is, is the mother of uh, the specification for testing the IoT requirements. Uh, unfortunately, the United States doesn't have anything comparable. And, but, and even the, the Etsy stuff, a lot of European countries are, uh, a lot of Asian countries are participating in that and using it. The United States sadly is not. So uh, one of the things I'm actually hoping for uh, going forward is that there will be increased international cooperation on all this stuff, uh, including, by the way, uh, these efforts. Uh, and I'll put a plug in uh, at the same institution I'm responsible for, for helping uh, facilitate coordination amongst all the, um, uh, the, um, the national security museums in different countries, uh, the, um, the um, educational efforts, affectionately known as Centers for Excellence, as well as the uh, library resources. And um, there's, there's a lot to be said for, for sharing in that level uh, and, and a realization of what's happening globally. Thanks, Tony. And we got another late last question here. I know we're running close on time, but um, the question was, do you recommend using your own personal routers instead of the ISP provided routers? And does that provide any more security using your own router versus what the ISP would give you? Yes and no, except uh, admittedly, uh, so I'm hung off of uh, Verizon's FIO service. I've taken their router and basically, <laughs> first thing I did is got into it administratively. I've, I've set up myself <laughs> as the administrator with my own password, and I set up my own variables, and I downloaded the latest patches to that router, and I tend to maintain it. I also um, have got a mechanism for looking constantly at, at who is uh, connected to everything uh, off that router and what traffic is going through it. Uh, admittedly, that's not easy for most people. I think at some point in time, I think the ISPs themselves are gonna be offering these kinds of services uh, as part of the package. And I think that should really help. Uh, this is non-trivial stuff. And uh, so the, uh, the short answer, I guess, is uh, you can do it, but it, it does require a lot of extra effort. Good. Well, I think that's all we have, uh, Christine. So back over to you. Tony, I want to thank you for uh, joining us today for uh, this cybersecurity chat um, brought to you by the National Cryptologic Museum Foundation. We thank um, all of you who were able to join us today, and we hope that you will be able to join us in the weeks to come. And I also do want to mention that during the week of um, November 9th, we'll actually be having uh, a number of chats per day to talk about cybersecurity careers uh, for National Cybersecurity Awareness, Career Awareness Week. So I hope that you'll join us uh, that week as well. Thank you all. Thanks, Tony. Thank you.